One set. Camera rolling. Sound. The good. The bad. And the just plain standard. Take one. Salut. Hey. All right. Welcome back to the good, the bad, and the just plain standard podcast, where we provide you with our inf informed opinions on movies we watch together. We are your hosts, Adam, Anu, and Jan. Today is all about our magic jingle. Do 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 do. Well, that was me butchering the theme of our magic. Um. Oh, oh, is that what that meant to be? <laughs> oh, hi, Paul. Who are you and what are you doing here? I was thinking exactly the same thing just a second ago. Um, uh, my name's Paul. I'm the director of uh, Our Magic. Awesome. Awesome. So at the very end, well, at the beginning of the end credits, there is a line um, producers would like to thank. And at the top of the list there, there is the 480. Would you like to elaborate on that a bit, please? Uh, well, it was a Kickstarter project. So we had 480 people who contributed to the Kickstarter campaign. And um, there was a point very close to the beginning where I was uh, talking to um, Michael Weber, who's one of the one of the uh, consultant producers on the project. And uh, we had just secured the money and, you know, the Kickstarter had ended. And so suddenly we had this money, but now I had to actually go out and make a documentary. And I said to him, it really feels like I've, I've got the weight of 480 people on my shoulders. And he said, good, you should feel that way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, that was it. And I have um, I have a sticker on my wall that says, remember the 480. So um, that's, and that's still there because occasionally, I think it's been maybe almost a year now, but occasionally we'll put something up on the Kickstarter site just for those guys. So, and, and maybe I'll do that again this weekend since... Uh, since I mentioned it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, the, the, for info, this episode will go uh, live in February. But So sometime in February, I'll put mm. something up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Comes out, oh, yeah, I've got to do that. Oh, yeah. That's uh, Blackpool month. So I, I figured. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's a rather unconventional documentary in the sense that there's just one question to kickstart the adventure. Mm -hmm. What is magic? And the story takes us places, even with some twists. Maddie kept referring to the project as a film, and it's closer to one, uh, I think, than a documentary, I believe. Um, we all have seen here uh, The Magic Box, Isolani and Con Men to some degree, not necessarily uh, in, uh, in a big screen for Con Men, but you, you, you wrote all that. So in, um, in other words, we noticed, uh, not sending you flowers, there's just a fact, really. Uh, we noticed that you know how to tell compelling stories and actually direct them. What do you think uh, feel makes a good subject matter for storytelling purposes? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a huge question, isn't it? Um, I think I think the the best the first thing that comes to mind is that you care about it. If you care about the story, where however you're planning to tell it, that that definitely comes through. And the you know magic is a form of storytelling, and that's one of the I think the key lessons from the film is that it's a way that some people choose to tell stories. Now, I think when you get to the, the the seven veils, all of those things actually matter in storytelling because if you make it something that you care about, and it doesn't have to be your story. It can just be a story that you've engaged with and chosen to tell, which, you know, if you're an actor, is important, right? Then if you if you care about it, then there's a sense that the audience definitely perceives. I think if we watch film or television where um, the people involved are just doing their job for that week or making some money, there's a definite sense of just getting through it. And, you know, um, you know, Paul is a fun film, the, uh, the, the science fiction movie. But I think when, you know, the big actor arrives at the end, you know, the, I won't say who it is to ruin the surprise for anybody, but there's a, you know, very famous science fiction actor turns up at the end. And clearly that actor was just there for a day, you know, and there's a real sense of coming and doing the job and getting out. And it doesn't feel, uh, just doesn't feel like it's part of the film. So as a storyteller, I think if you, if you care about it, then you care how you tell it and you care how it's heard. And I think that with our magic, it all came, it all began with that, that emotion. I think you get the sense for that in the very opening of the film where it's the, the journey through the magic collection. And I, I've never really seen anything quite like that. And it, already within that first 
beginning title sequence, I'm kind of in, I'm engaged in this whole new world that I've I've never really thought about mm, at all. The slow pan, yeah. which is very kind of thought provoking. Yeah, I, you know the, the collections are interesting. There's three collections there actually, and uh, it's um, it's kind of it was important to me at the beginning to show how far the story goes back and how involved and colourful the story is. And I think the the, the titles do that. Um, you know, and in a couple of those collections, we had a couple of hours, maybe, to go in and do it. And in uh, John Gon's collection, which is spectacular, John Gon builds illusions for the greatest magicians in the world, but he builds beautiful illusions and he restores, you know, he, he's the guy that restored the Turk, the chess player. And, you know, we only had a little bit of time there to go in, film and get out because it was a workshop that day. It was a busy workshop. And on that day, Teller was coming in with Johnny Thompson. So we had to be done by the time they, they got there. So, you know, I was literally putting down track, you know, staging shots. And, you know, by the time we were done, I had to come back for an afternoon and uh, shoot that, that beautiful little opening piece where the ring appears mm -hmm. in there. Um, but, you know, the feeling you get when you go to those collections is really interesting, especially for me, because I'm a, I am a magician and I know a lot about magic, but I really don't know anything about any of that stuff unless it's been told to me by John Gaughan or by Jim Steinmeier or one of these guys that has made those, those things come to life because that's their thing. And it's an aspect of that particular art that's really intricate and detailed and every little piece has a little story that goes with it. There's not a lot of art forms that are like that, mm. really. And, you know, there's little pieces in there that were made just for one guy to do. And then there was never another one made. And it was never performed again because sometimes nobody wanted to. There were better ways to do it. You know, technology moves on. And sometimes we don't actually know what they were doing. We just, you know, it just was doing something and there's a whole piece missing. But the piece is an intellectual part of the puzzle. You know, why does that have that cog in that wheel there? We don't know, but there it is. He made it with his own hands. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So when you go there, you're kind of overwhelmed as you walk through by the variety of stuff. So the opening titles kind of was an attempt to, to do that with the audience a little bit and to sort of make them think, wow, there's a lot going on here. I think expectation is, is huge whenever you come into any kind of film or story and if you can play with that expectation a little bit, then that's good. And this was an attempt to do that, you know. So, yeah, the collections were, all three collections do gel as one. And most people have no idea that, that it was three. But the three collections was John Gon's collection, which, uh, you know, Jan is a magician. He knows what a huge name that is in the art. And uh, then the other collection belonged to Mike Caveney, another big name, who's interviewed in the movie as well as John. And, uh, and, you know, the story of how he got his collection is fantastic. I mean, utterly fantastic. Um, the Egyptian Hall Museum, it was called, and they split it up between him and another guy. But then there's, um, a collection by, uh, a friend of ours, um, called, uh, Kenny. And, you know, Kenny's a, you know, he's a poor baker and he lives in, you know, in the middle of America. And, um, you know, he has a couple of little bakeries around there. And, um, you know, one of his, one of his clients is a very small company uh, called McDonald's. And so he makes all the buns for McDonald's. <laughs> and so, uh, Ken's collection is, is utterly amazing. But what we didn't show you, because it's not what the film was about, is how you get to the collection. Because uh. he has this astonishing house, this big, you know, you know, he's a billionaire and he has this astonishing house. His wife, uh, has stables and she breeds horses and, you know, he has three houses in the, in the vicinity. And, um, you know, you go in and, uh, we went in and we met him the very first time. We didn't film anything the first time because it was for a different project before it became our magic. And Jason, uh, typically hadn't, well, he had thought it through, but he hadn't completely decided to tell me his, his thinking, which was that we've never met this guy. He doesn't really know who we are other than one phone call. We probably shouldn't rock up with a bunch of cameras. And he decided to explain that to me when we rocked up with a bunch of cameras. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. <laughs> so we walked in and, and Ken's a super smart guy. And uh, he's never met us before. And, you know, he, he sat us down. Now, off microphone, I'll tell you what he said. 
Um, but that's when we found out that, you know, we were, uh, we were dealing with a very smart cookie. And um, he said, well, would you like to see the collection? So where is it? Well, you know, it's a big house, but we could tell there was no wing, you know, dedicated to the sticking off the side of the house. And he um, he said, well, we go here and we walk down some stairs. And at the bottom of the stairs, there's a lovely little room. And in there, there's a, there's a few little artifacts. And it really isn't what we were expecting. It's quite small. And um, there was a set of elevator doors, like old, from an old building. You know, the type that you pull apart. And you go in there and you step in, you're standing in this old wooden elevator. You go in and it starts shaking and moving down and then it opens up and you're now in this unbelievable underground space. Uh, he tells you it's something like 300 feet underground. I'm not sure how accurate. Well, I, I think I know how accurate that is. But you're now in a completely different world. Um, and there's another guy um, who's not featured in this, who doesn't have a, a magic collection, who has the same type of experience where you go downstairs and as you're going downstairs, um, you know, edit this for China, but it feels like you're going back in time because, you know, you, you're definitely in the real world at the top. But when you get to the bottom and you open the door, it's, it's every detail is as convincing as it can be that you're in a different era. So it's it's astonishing. But that's not what the film was about. So that that part of the experience wasn't included. So, you know. But again, that was one of, that was interesting. And unlike John, who didn't really know us at the time and I think would be more generous with his time now, he was busy that day, John gone. So you guys are welcome, but I need to do this in a, in a moment. Whereas Ken said, uh, um, by the time we knew him very well at this point, the second time we went, Ken said, uh, so, you know, uh, I'm, I've got a business meeting and, um, you guys do what you want. And now we're alone in the house with this multi, multi, multi million dollar collection, you know, which has all sorts of crazy, it has in there the, the light and heavy chest, which you see in the opening titles. It's this wooden box with a brass inlay key. And it's the chest that apparently Robert Houdin used to stop a war in Algeria by making um, the, I was going to say leader of the opposition, <laughs> <laughs> by making the, the generals of the other army think that they had lost all of their strength. They couldn't lift up the chest, but a small child could lift it up. So he then gave them back their strength and they could lift it up. And it was an electromagnet uh, that they were standing on a metal plate underneath a carpet. Today, it's a lot harder to fool people with something like that. Whereas, oh, wow. you know, a hundred and so years ago, where that technology was quite new and, you know, most people wouldn't know it, was a great use of the technology. Is that story true? Uh Let's just enjoy it for what it is. <laughs> but that's the story he used to tell when he did the show. Well, that chest is in that room, and you can pick it up. And it's it's amazing. So, yeah, there's there's great history involved. And I think the, you know, the opening title was just a way to give you a little insight into that before we actually talked about it a little bit during the... Um, actually, Ken's in the movie. I keep forgetting Ken's like, Ken's like a whole section of the movie. <laughs> Yeah, that was something. Yeah, mm. I've I've never been to. I met at the historic conference uh, at an historian conference. Mike Evney and uh, Bill Kalush and John Gon. Mm -hmm. uh, That's an yeah. interesting group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of storytelling, again, I've noticed something. I talked about that to Maddie. Um, it it can't be a random chance. You know the way the um, the shots were composed. Um, like it's pretty. It was pretty apparent to me when um, Ma Max Maven came on and Bill Kalush, were the sh those shots designed to actually reflect a bit of the personality of the people that were actually being filmed? Well, definitely. Um, it's not always easy because you don't have a lot of options. But with Maddie, uh, I, I had to have an environment I could control. And I felt it was really interesting to put him into the same kitchen that we shot our magic, um, the magic box in. He brought that up, yeah. He's like, yeah. you can see that room in the uh, magic box. I was like, yeah. you still can, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we've had a few magicians arrive there, and, and you know, because a magician friend of mine, uh, Paul Nardini's house, and they sit there and about 10 minutes in, they start to look around and you realize they've seen the film. So I thought that was interesting from my point of view is, is rather than just have a very blank space. But... I also had to control it because the idea in that film was this was really the first time an awful lot of people knew who Maddie was. And, you know, I remember we, we showed the film at Matt King's house in Las Vegas and Lance Burton was sitting there and uh, Lance 
I uh, really liked the film. He loved the film. And I remember him leaning in when Maddie was coming up throughout the movie saying, who, who is he? Doesn't know him. He knows all these other people, but who's Maddie? Well, and he was impressed. You know, this guy really knows his stuff. And when we got to the section, which was quite, you know, I think cleverly placed to reveal that he has no hands mm -hmm. and he's still a magician and he's still, you know, it hasn't stopped him in any way. And in fact, quite the opposite if you, if you know him. But that was, I told him when, when I called him, that was the idea was to, to make that completely unimportant until we focus on it, but we'll focus on it very late in the movie so that you as an artist is represented throughout the film beforehand. Um, and so, you know, it, then the creative choice was, I'll put him in that space because that felt really interesting and, and cool. Then with, with Max, particularly, you know, Max had a lot of thoughts on film and there's, there's a segment which is not in there, but it's in the extra features or I think it's online somewhere, but you can, uh, we talk about movies that got cut out because, you know, we had to cut something. You saw the, the one that we showed at, uh, yeah, at uh, Magicon, which was a good 20, Four minutes longer than that or something. On Vimeo, you've got a deleted scene, so it's mm. probably in this one. Yeah, so it's, it's in there. But Max had a lot of thought on that, and um, I felt I wanted something. Max, you know, famously always wears black, you know, and uh, he, I thought, I wanted somewhere that sort of reflected that, and I was really struggling. And the place I stay in L.A. is where we shot that. And as I was walking out one day, I looked, and I went, well, that's it right there. And um, I took a couple of shots, I realized we could position this light that was on the other side of the room so you could see that sort of like the Melies, um moon in the background. And so that was why that was staged the way it was. And then with um, with Bill, it was easy because, you know, we went to the Conjuring Arts Center, which is in New York, fantastic space, non-profit dedicated to sharing the history of the art of magic in terms of literature. And he has this room, which is where you see the... Um, where you see the uh, him sitting, and in that room are, you know, these books that go back hundreds of years, and it's especially, you know, air conditioned, humidif dehumidified space, or humidified space, whatever it is. Don't let me look after your books, <laughs> but whatever it is, that is a very expensive room full of very expensive books, and he is absolutely at home there. You can ask him a question about anything on that shelf, and he knows the answer. He is not just a collector of, of you know just random pieces. He knows everything that's on that shelf. And um, and then the other thing was to, to put books in front of the camera uh, so that you could see, you know, the the depth of, of him as an individual by seeing him through books that were out of focus in the foreground. So those two choices were, were kind of derived from trying to figure out who he was as an individual and what what surrounding him would make the most sense. And that, that's easy if you go to someone's place, you know. Mike Elizaldi, who's not in the main film, but is in the, the film part, we shot him in his office and he's surrounded by all these mannequins that he's made for Hellboy and um, Pan's Labyrinth and, you know, all these things that he's actually made and designed and created. And he's surrounded by it in his office. So it's easy. You just switch the camera on, you've got a great shot. Other people, it was a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, uh, Steve... Um, Bargazzi, who's the guy who was bitten by the dog when he was a child, um, you know, phenomenal magician, great comedy magician, but we had to grab him and take him to the hotel room at an event. That's the only space we had. So most of the time we tried. You get that a lot in documentaries and I've always, I've never really questioned it till I watched this and it reflects our personalities. For example, I just watched the, the new Netflix documentary about, uh, Jim Carrey mm. doing, uh, Andy Kuhlman and, uh, the main ball. Kaufman. Kaufman, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, and it's when you, you see Jim Carrey in this sort of like, it almost feels like a presidential room. And mm. it's a very odd feeling to it. But then again, that whole documentary is in itself odd because the subject matter is so bizarre. One of, the, one of the things we wanted to do with our, well, I, I considered doing with our magic was having people talk directly into the camera. And Jason made a really interesting point about that. He said, we know people, Max Maven, Matt King, Bill Kalush, who absolutely can do that. Absolutely they can do that. You tell them to do it and they they know how to have a presence on camera in that way. But at that point we didn't know exactly who we were going to get to and you know, if Maddie would have been com comfortable doing that, maybe he hasn't got the experience. I think he would. But I do think that it was alien at that time in such a way that some of the people we've spoken to 
might not have been comfortable doing that. And so we made the decision not to do it because there was no guarantee we could do it with everybody. But on that particular documentary, you know, he he engages very much and you can see him looking off sometimes. He looks into the camera sometimes. I think it's a great thing with documentary right now. If you get the feeling they're talking to you, mm. um, that's a really powerful thing. And we're seeing more of that right now. Um, and I think it'll be easier to do simply because people know what it looks like mm. in the future. Okay. Hmm. Well, in terms of kind of behind the scenes, so you, on screen there is just one question, but did you have questions I mean, behind the scene, or did you just ask that question and then from their answers elaborate the story? Uh, that's interesting only because, yes, there were definitely questions. There was, a, there was a core list of questions. And so I went in saying, I'm going to ask everybody these questions. And then and I have this book. It's like a huge moleskin, you know, book just filled with little bits of paper of everybody's. I had to go through and grade everybody's answers and then record everyone's answers and kind of pre-visualize the documentary afterwards and that's not necessarily the best way to do it it was the best way for me to do it on paper so i asked everybody the same question so i i could make it almost every time i wanted to get to one of these topics i had a buffet of people that i could you know but the issue with that is as a, as a filmmaker you have to represent both sides of the story so i had to be quite careful that i you know yes a lot of people have asked, you know, why am I not in it and Jason's not in it and um, or Dan and Dave, you know. And I felt that we were in every frame one way or the other because we had we had made this happen, right? Mm. So we were in it. And therefore, my selections are, are how we've cherry-picked. But most people kind of answer them the same direction anyway. And that might be down to the, the fact that, you know, we're asking people the same questions, but the people we're asking are people that we kind of relate to anyway. But, you know, Richard Kaufman, who's in there, is, you know, if he doesn't feel that way, he's not going to say one way or another just to make you feel happy. And neither is anybody else in that film. So I think what we ended up covering, for the most part, is universal truths, but truths that hopefully wouldn't be apparent to anybody outside of the of the art or the craft. So, um yeah, there were lots of questions and a lot of questions that didn't make it in, um, but they they did hopefully make it into the the deleted scenes. But then there are some that I didn't edit simply because I made choices early on. But, you know, the ethical one is really interesting, which is in the deleted scenes, simply because, you know, we talk about, you know, should a, a mind reader reveal that it's, it's not real? Hmm. Um, or, you know, um, my argument has always been the same. Should an actor reveal that this uh, other player is not dead and that we haven't really killed him, just wave to everybody, Bob, he's okay, he's fine, let's just carry on with the with mm, the story that yeah. we're trying to tell you. Or should the mind reader say, okay, let's all imagine I can really do this and go with it. doesn't matter what you do, and Max says this in the deleted scenes, if you dress as a clown with a giant red nose and you do one mind reading trick, someone will come up to you and ask you to read their mind at the end of the show because people will believe so, you know, the ethics of that was really interesting, but it didn't fit with the, the way the whole movie went. So that particular question veered the, off. The message, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, so obviously, when you are shooting a film or a documentary, you have a filming ratio, i.e. you will not be using all the footage in the can in the final product. Now, mm -hmm. Maddie was wondering if you've kept all the hours of discussion with him. Um, yeah, because, you know, I sometimes suffer from insomnia. So I put that on, I, I'm straight to sleep listen to Maddie talk about anything. It's, it's very boring. Um, of course, we've got all the footage. And, you know, contrary to uh, what I just said, it's fascinating stuff. And that, of course, was a big challenge was how do you take all this fascinating stuff and make choices? So yeah, there is stuff there. And, um, you know, it's all in that giant book of what do we have? But do we need to go through all of that? I don't think so. I think, you know, all the interesting documentaries that I like personally, I'm sure have tons of footage that you could make an entire different documentary of. But if you've chosen the best or you've made your choice, stick with your choice. Mm. So I, I, I hopefully, you know, we're not going to destroy it. We're not going to get rid of it, you know, um, but I don't see the need to make anything else out of it. Yeah. Okay. Except to blackmail Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> I always like documentaries that are very fixed in what they believe. You brought up at the start about how 
um, the difference between when you want to tell a story as opposed to when you're doing a job. Um, one of the, my favourite documentaries I've seen recently, which has got mixed review, is the Louis Theroux about the My Scientology movie, mm. because that documentary feels like a filmmaker trying to get footage to make another documentary that doesn't and the story of making that documentary becomes more an interesting event than the actual subject matter you set out to make in the first place. So I think when it comes to when it comes to in this case for um cuz me and Anouk aren't advanced in any sort of magic. I mean when we started becoming more pally with Jan, Jan mentioned that he goes to Edinburgh at the fringe at the magic festival and the fringe I'm like there's people at the fringe do magic and then once Jan starts showing me footage I'm like of course there is. Of, co- of course there is cuz to most people, um, the most experience I had of magic was um, the Penn and Teller TV show, The Fool Us, which was mm. quite good. And it, I always liked when the magicians had the one thing they specialised, particularly, uh, I don't know why it sticks in my mind, but it was a guy that could solve like three Rubik's Cubes like, and made a show out of it. So I guess it's always, it's, it's strange because you never really give magic the due respect that every other creative profession gets. Because magic, I, I, it's, I feel like it's because it's so rooted and old, people kind of forget about it in a way. I think it's deeper than that. Uh, it's a very, very, you know, long discussion. But the, the issue with magic has always been the sense that you can buy that and just do it. And that's yeah. that's covered in the film, you know. We, you know, when Matt King talks about the the comedy clubs and the other com- comedians hating them because a lot of guys would just get up, and do a trick with the, you know, the presentation they got with a little piece of paper, and they um, they get great reactions. Of course, they do. These are great tricks. You can buy a particular trick. I'm sure you could guess what it is from the the magic shop in New York, New York uh, Hotel in Las Vegas. They will show you how to do it in about you know, three minutes and you could walk in and look as good as any magician in the world, just doing that thing that they give you and doing, you know, not even doing it particularly well because the thing itself is fantastic. And this, this comes from the fact that, you know, magic is partly a pitching medium in that, you know, they've been pitching, you know, special deck of cards that can do anything. And the feeling that you can go and buy something does hurt magic in some ways. Whereas, and it's a little bit like the app market, you know, where if you show somebody something, something amazing, magic trick or anything on your phone, you know you can go to the app store and buy that. Mm. And that sense exists with some magic, okay, with some magic. So over the last few years, I think what's happened, and it's something Eric talks about, I think in the film or maybe in another interview, he talks about this idea that the audience start to associate the art with levels like music. You know, I like this type of music. I don't like that type of music. I know that this guy's, you know, just playing something that he's learned half an hour ago. And this person is, you know, a, um, a master of, you know, the, the, the instrument that he or she is playing. So, the the idea that people can appreciate the levels of magic the way you can if you're in magic where you know someone who's just doing a trick you know this does this and bang that's amazing okay great to somebody like Tamaris who takes the simplest thing and makes it into something utterly astonishing because of everything that he brings to the table that surrounds it so magic tends to suffer from this idea that it's and we, again, this is absolutely said in the film, you know, people see a bad magician, they think they don't like magic. And that's really wrong. Mm. And it's not fair, but it's just the way it's been. Because of Fool Us, because of David Blaine, Dynamo, um, suddenly there's so much of it out there that people get a sense of what they like and what they don't like. Um, they still make assumptions. You know, a lot of people tell me, you know, I don't, you know, I like, I like close up magic on the street or street magic, but I don't like, big illusions. And I say, oh, what big illusion show have you been to see? None. <laughs> but they may be seen some on television and it just doesn't do it any justice mm. at all. I, I think David Copperfield got the closest because he approached it like a filmmaker. Him and his mm. team looked at it and said, we're going to try and bring the audience in in a certain way. And it those are definitely my favorite big illusion magic specials. And uh, even the close-up magic on those things, really great. But a lot of them, you know, they... 
they are of the time, you know, the 1980s stuff with David Copperfield really looks like the 1980s stuff with David Copperfield and the 1990s stuff. And so he hasn't really done anything in that space at all in the last 10 years in terms of doing stuff on television because he's concentrated on the live experience. Mm -hmm. And if you see a live illusion show, even a bad one, I would say, there's still a point where you go, this isn't happening because, you know, 200 years worth of inventors have contributed to this, this person on stage doing what they're doing. And if you think about it, then, you know, it'll have an impact. And then you put it in the hands of someone who really knows what they're doing, and then they'll make you care about it. And then you're in an entirely different, uh, different field. You know, I, you know, Copperfield show right now has a movie baked into the middle of the show. <laughs> I mean, genuine, you know, this is, this is stuff that happens in the movies. We're going to do it right now. Um, don't want to give anything away, but yeah, have you seen, have you seen it at all recently? Yeah. If you go to Vegas, definitely see that show, but, and it's changing all the time because he's trying to, you know, he's trying to intensify the experience. So then you go across the street and there's a guy just doing 10 tricks that, you know, they're good. They're great. Some of them he has no right to do. He's stolen them from other people. Um, and then, you know, you go up and you see Penn and Teller and these guys are, reviving the show every single month. They're bringing something new in. They've got people working on new stuff. They're rehearsing. These guys don't have to rehearse. They've got their name up there on the billboards. You know, nobody wants to get rid of them. They're huge stars, but they're really working hard to keep the show fresh. And then Matt King, who has essentially been doing the same show um, for a very long time. He's added a few pieces. He He's great. And I've seen that show 30, 40 times because the audience is the star of the show. The audience makes the show different every single time. So suddenly you just going between those shows, you realize this is a very, very, you know, diverse art. And you can do that at the fringe. You know, I think what tends to happen with magic is there's stuff that I could name 10 tricks off the top of my head that a lot of people do. And they all do them in exactly the same way. And as soon as people start saying, wow, then they don't really go any further than that. They, they add another trick and another trick. They don't refine. Mm. And that's a form of magic that's that's disposable, I think. And I think that's what people think of. Mm. Um, but then, you know, it's uh, maybe there's going to be another giant dip. There was a very big dip in the early 2000s. People really didn't care for it. And you kind of had to force people to watch it. But the funny thing was, as soon as people engaged with it, they were compelled by the right people. Um, and by the right approach. So it's a, that's a, but you know, we're getting into stuff that's in the movie, you know, the film kind of covers a lot of that. Wow. <laughs> um, well, you, you ran out of money at some point. So that's, you used your own, that, that's the I ran out of money this morning. Wait, no, 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 that's the life that we chose. I mean, um, yeah, no, I mean, I've had, I've backed many Kickstarter projects and some they left with the money to repay their student loans. So, you know, Kickstarter, mm. yeah, there are some great Kickstarter horror stories mm. online. Just, oh, God, yeah. I can imagine some of the, some of the rubbish you can get is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that the responsibility of a Kickstarter. Going back to the beginning and that whole thing with, you know, I was sitting with uh, Mike Weber, Jason, Derek Delgadio, and uh, myself. And, you know, Jason's like, the, you know, unflappable in any situation, um, including, you know, um, choking out somebody for attacking a woman in a CVS pharmacy, which is another story. But, you know, he's, he's calm and doesn't seem too bothered, but I'm literally having a you know a massive panic attack because suddenly we've got i think 65,000 somewhere in that and i have to deliver a film for that and the biggest problem is is that guy sitting in the back of my brain who says okay this is what we're going to do and of course we could have delivered a very simple very uncomplicated answer to the the challenge right you know here's a bunch of interviews just thrown together but i wanted to do something else. And at that lunch, um, I, you know, Weber said, you know, quite rightly, you should feel that way because it is a huge responsibility. And I thought, okay, but it, it just can't happen unless it happens to the level that I want it to happen to. So the Dan and Dave Buck, who, you know, 
really made this happen because, you know, they've created a marketplace, but they've also created a following and they've established a certain level of trust, have now entrusted me with a level of that trust. And at the same time, you know, they are overseeing the process. So there was a point where, you know, we were running out of money and we needed to spend, you know, several thousand to get to the next step. And we, you know, collectively had to put that money in ourselves. It, you know, we <laughs> we're never going to see that money. Um, but it, it was definitely worth it. I think we're all happy that we spent our, that money. So in a way, you know, it's the 484 or whatever, you know, but the, the approach to some Kickstarter projects are very much about promising and putting amazing resources into the promise and then almost half as much, if not much less into the actual delivery part of it. And I think that disappointment is very, is, is bitter for the people that, that trust it. And it does in actual fact convey itself to those of us who do, you know, take it seriously, that we are still painted with that brush. Mm. Um, it's one of the reasons that I'm very resistant to crowdfunding. You know, we tried to crowdfunding, crowdfund something last year and for various reasons it didn't work, mostly because we needed to really shatter a huge, not just one, but several glass ceilings in terms of how money was directed towards a UK project. So, you know, we were very ambitious and it didn't work out. And as a result, we moved on and we ended up doing Isolani. But the the fear that started to build up as we started to get a couple of the big donations coming through, or the backers, the fear was that I'm going to be sitting with that amount of money and I'm going to have to make this movie that's in my head. And, you know, as much as I I think, you know, this is what we're going to do, I'm always wanting to push this much further. So that's a very different way of thinking about it to the way some people think about Kickstarter. And I do think some people abuse it. But I also think that the really valuable Kickstarter projects, and I know you've backed a, a few of them, you know, like, you know, Con Man's a great one, right? They really deliver them what they promised. Yeah. And that attitude is what I'm trying to, you know, be part of. But it's not. If you think it's it's free money, then you already should not do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. It's the most expensive money I've ever been entrusted with, you know. Yeah, that's that's very true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um I'm going to just drop one name uh on this episode. So how did Larry Fong get into the project? Larry uh Larry Fong was one of our, our bigger backers and um very supportive of the project. And Larry is is somebody that I met, I think, um, I met him at the castle or I met him at, at a convention somewhere. No idea who he was in terms of what he did for a living. Just a really, you know, interesting guy, nice guy. Um, we, we like the same types of things in magic and, um, you know, nice. That's one of the great things with magic. You can meet anybody if they're interested in magic and you could, you know, you will see, you know, um, a, billionaire uh, media mogul sitting with, you know, uh, a minimum wage, um, you know, car parts builder and having a, having a beer together. That will happen in the magic world. It's very rare anywhere else. And, um, you know, eventually it dawned on me who Larry was. And um, that's very, very exciting when you're into film, right? And then, you know, the next time you just think, well, yeah, but I like having lunch and I don't want to bother him too much. But then he jumps in and helps you in the way that he did. And, um, you know, he was super helpful in, in every level. But also, you know, he was a great, um, it was great to know that you had someone you could call if you needed to. And we didn't need to. I, I'm saving that phone call, you know, to the, and I don't mean to say, you know, help me with more money. I just mean, what do you think I should do based on what you know? Mm. And that's, you know, um, this is a guy who's worked on every level of the film business. But he's also a guy who's, you know, it's still his work. It's his art. It's, his, it's what he does. And it's not necessarily who he is. It's part of who he is. And I think if you only look at someone in terms of who they are, in terms of what they do, then you're losing a lot. I'm very fortunate to know him as a, as, as a friend before I kind of realized that he was part of this world that, you know, we're all working so hard to be part of. But Larry is um, very good and has continued to support, you know, everything that I've done in terms of, you know, encouragement and, 
um, you know, uh, interesting story working on a project right now. And I, you know, I've known Larry for a long time, but I hadn't been to his house, which was somewhere in the Hollywood Hills. Um, I don't know how long he's lived there, a couple of years now at least, but um, I have a friend who I'm working with on another project and we have meetings at his house, which is in the Hollywood Hills. And um, Larry and I were going for dinner and I was in Universal Studios. And I didn't have my car and he called me and said, well, I'll send you an Uber. So I met the Uber, I got in the car and then through some freak accident, the Uber took me to my other friend's house. So I thought, and then I realized um, Larry and Harris were next door neighbors <laughs> and had no idea. <laughs> so, nice. and, uh, so I'd been actually next door to his house like, dozens of times. And um, I just wish that had paid off with me leaving while he was leaving because that would have been the moment. But yeah, it was very, very bizarre. So yeah, Larry, you know, just again, it's one of those great things about magic. It can put you into really interesting positions with uh, people from all sorts of walks of life. You know, and not just, you know, being, you know, potentially one of the, I, I think one of the most gifted and, and solid directors of photography, just looking at his style, it, you know, it, it, he has actually created a style with the, some of the stuff he's done with Snyder. But, you know, just watching uh, the Kong movie, there's a sequence in there, which is just astonishing. And, you know, he's, he's just matter of fact about it but well, I, I still don't entirely understand how it was done so you know uh, so he's a magician in many ways <laughs> I also like the fact that he does one of my tricks most often whenever he's asked to do a trick it's one of mine that he picks up and does <laughs> and uh, nice. he keeps telling me about it which is which is lovely so <laughs> nice so the premiere was at MagicCon mm. which was uh, so I've attended many different sorts of magic conventions and this one is a mix of uh, TED Talks and uh, Essential Magic Conference. It's a mix of many things, and uh, you premiered uh, our magic there. So how, yeah. did you, how, did, how did you, were you apprehensive to finally deliver to the world? Or wow. um, Yeah, I think that was the first experience with being, um, it's, not an, it's not a pleasant experience, I don't think, to show your work to uh, any audience for the first time. Because, you know, it, it's, an, it's such an unknown entity. And as a magician, that applies to every single new piece I might add to the repertoire. And if you're a creative guy or, or girl and you've got this idea, at some point you're going to have to test it and you're going to have to find out if it works. So in magic, this can happen quite often, you know. And um, But with something like a film where there's only so much you can fix or there's only so much you can't go back and shoot again if, in, in these cases, it is very, very, um, you know, sphincter tightening to say the least <laughs> um and you know you can't help but be a bit of a dick about it and you know i you know that, that that's <laughs> i remember moving all the speakers i was standing in the middle of the floor looking listening to the speakers and going that one needs to go over there and i want that one turned and you know dave buck is just staring at me going where's where has this complete prat come from <laughs> but you know I, I cared about a lot about that and I, I cared a lot about it because a lot of those 480 people were there and that made it really the most to me that was the the moment where people would find out how serious we take in their <laughs> their contribution and um you know i think it, it did go well i mean people seemed to like it so that was great and um i was glad they liked it very very glad they liked it i don't feel that way entirely about everything you know the audience doesn't really get a say in, in my opinion i know that sounds really arrogant but you know i think the audience gets a say when I choose the material that I want to work on and they get a say in, you know, their appreciation of it. But if I, if I go purely by what the audience wants, then I don't get to do what, what I want and therefore nothing interesting or original happens, um, you know, and suddenly we're in the Marvel universe. But mm -hmm. the, the way that I, I really thought of it was that, you know, I'm going to do something that I think is my, way of expressing what I think magic is through the voices of the people that I choose and with the help of all of these people in that audience. Therefore, it had a weight that I don't think I feel quite as badly in other projects. But um, yeah, so long answer to a short question. Is that a conscious decision when you decide where you want to premiere a film then? Well, um, I think when you're... Uh, when you're Steven Spielberg, yes. Uh, you know, I'd like to premiere this on, uh, you know, 
on the back of Jan's head. Absolutely, no problem. We'll do that right now, Mr. Spielberg. But the I think for uh, from the point of view, certainly the situation we're in now, where we're very much in the indie mm. world, um, you know, where you premiere it is 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 down to um, lots of factors. Mm. Where can you premiere it? Um, will premiering it impact your your chances at festivals and stuff? So you have to take all of that into account. So your choices are are limited mm. uh, by your opportunities. But um, but yeah, if you're uh, you know if you're the world's greatest director, then you you know you can you can tell people where you're going to show it. You know, mm. we recently um, reviewed the Disaster Artist, um, which me and Jan had both read the book by then, and it was mm. a very interesting segment in the end about where it's where Tommy tries his best to premiere his the room at the Chinese Theatre. Uh, he makes multiple in the hundreds of phone calls to try and just get it done, and it just doesn't happen. Which I always find so amusing that the fact that I think to everyone else you just like, oh, it's on, it's on at the cinema. It's like it's the first time, or they assume it's either the UK or Hollywood or wherever your film comes out. But I guess nobody really thinks about with wh- the first time that your film is seen by other people because we luckily got to see Isolani when it on its UK premiere. And I had I had no idea what a, a, a premiere was like. I think I always had like the idea of how um, you see like all these red carpet events, with all these cameras and stuff. But actually going in to see it is a totally new experience for mm. anyone. I think. Yeah, it's hard, especially with you know premieres are, are difficult simply because they're they're not entirely about the film. They're mm. about the occasion. They're about you know the celebration. And that has issues, which you guys have mentioned, and you know, entirely on your side on all of that. But it's it's just one of the things you have to deal with. You know, at the end of the day, it, it's it's not the best way to to fully experience a film at the first time. I remember seeing Star Wars at the Chinese theater, not when it first came out, although I did. I was old enough to see it here as a seven year old kid. But it was re released while I was working at the Magic Castle, so I was in LA for a couple of weeks and. That re-release was on a particular day, and we got tickets through a friend who worked at the castle. Magicians, right? You know a magician, knows a magician, he knows a magician. So we, we got these tickets, and uh, myself and a friend of mine, we stood in line, and the line snaked all the way around to get in, to see it in the big room, which is this huge, beautiful theatre, in the, the main room in the Chinese theatre. And uh, as we were snaking around, we were suddenly stopped. We were stopped in that area in the front where everyone does their handprints. So we were stopped in the premium place for the most astonishing little publicity stunt. All the press were there taken. And they start playing, you know, the, the, the Empire theme and open the doors and out comes Darth Vader followed by, you know, 40 stormtroopers all marching to the, you know, and it was, it was great. And then we went in. I was so excited. And then every couple of minutes, somebody would whoop and cheer or worse, wave a lightsaber around. <laughs> oh, you just wow. couldn't get into the film, and every time you did, they ripped you back out. Wow! Because it was a celebration, mm. you know. In that same theater, I went to see um, the Wizard of Oz, uh, which was in a full packed theater. They were showing it. It was a re- it was a renovated, a renovated, a restored print. And it, first of all, it was fantastic. If you've never seen it in the big screen, it's an astonishing film, absolutely astonishing film. Uh, I was definitely the, maybe there was somebody else, but I didn't see them and it was a packed theater. I was definitely the only straight guy there. It was the, it was the most fun, the most, and it was, again, it was celebratory, but it was a musical and it engaged people with the music and the, the whole thing was great. And leaving the theater was a thrill. The whole thing went really well. That didn't work for me with Star Wars, mm. you know, because Star Wars wants to draw you in and, uh, you know, sell you on this universe. Whereas you kind of want to skip along the yellow brick road. Yeah. yeah. If you're, if you're sucked into that film and you know, you do realize that flying monkeys are terrifying in that space. But I think that, you know, where the real premiere happens when people start to pay money to go see it and sit and hopefully, um, you know, switch their phones off. (laughs) <laughs> Talking about magic, that would be impossible. But, uh, you know. Yeah, well, by the way, I cheated on you guys. I went to see The Room at the Glasgow Film Theatre yesterday. <gasps> That's an event. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> how, how long did you last? Uh, well, 
you have to have seen the movie first, but the, it's always, well, I guess it's always like that, but subtitled. Is it? <laughs> yes. Oh. I'm pretty sure so it's funny to have like an oh. English speaking film with the English subtitles and spoons flying over your head. I knew of the spoons. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, yeah, you've got house rules and everything. Um, There's a drinking game, apparently. Oh, God. Well, there must be. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah Connor, uh, my son, told me about it. Because I, I said, you, you know, do you want to go see the room tomorrow night? I was like, please say no. Please say no. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, no, I've seen it. And uh, he told me there was a, there's a drinking game. And I don't even want to know what it is. I, yeah. <laughs> Every time he says, oh, hi. That's got to be so one. And so and yeah. so. That's got to be one. I think there, if there was a rule, like every line that's dubbed is like, that's game over. That is mm -hmm. game over if it's that's one of the rules. Oh. Yeah, yeah, put the hospital on speed dial. <laughs> <you start> <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, you talk presenting your um, your stuff to audiences. Uh, I think it was in the Rain Dance episode we talked about something you shared, and I've seen you share it quite frequently. The 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 image where uh, you're on stage and you see the the whole audience, and you actually only see that one guy with the arm folded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cartoon. Yeah, the yeah. I I would pay to own that cartoon. And, and I think every performer would, and every artist would. I, I think it's hard. I, it's one of the things people don't understand that it's not that we're looking for approbation. It's not that we're looking for acceptance. It's not that we're really looking for applause. But it, because it's an, in, hopefully it's an, you know there's a big internal part of what we do. Hopefully, that frowning face somehow tells us there's something wrong somewhere that we don't fully understand and then it becomes like a seed that grows and grows and grows and the more you think about it the worse it gets so yeah i've i've done shows where i'm as a performer and people have said you know that's fantastic and everyone's loving it and it's just that one person and every live performer you know whether you're acting in a play or you're talking directly to the audience you you just there's just that thing you can't get over and everyone else is trying to tell you how great it was but you're still obsessed by that one little negative thing. Mm. And the amount of weight that carries, I think it's just a psychological mechanism that's designed to protect us. So, you know, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping to learn how to do is to just never, ever look at any kind of um, review or um, any kind of commentary on anything. I think it's hard to do because sometimes you just find yourself looking. But... The simple fact is, is you cannot please all of the people. And if you do, the very best you can hope for is to be just okay for everybody or almost everybody. I'd rather be Marmite. I'd rather be you hate it or you love it. And the problem with that is, is that as much as I would rather do that, as much as that's my choice, um, that doesn't mean I can deal with it. Mm. <laughs> so that's just in the nature of what we choose to do. And it, the simple fact is, is that, you know, you have to be brave to do anything. Yeah, in because, the first place. Yeah, everybody, everybody can do better because they don't have to. So they can tell you how you can fix something. Oh, you, why, why didn't you do that? And you should have done this. And a big, big comment on our magic is that, you know, there are, there's no magic in the movie. But one of the points we make, although in actual fact, you know, the stuff you see Maddy do is pretty, you know, is is pretty mind blowing. But it had to be there to show you something. Otherwise, you know, how would you know? But there's no magic there for a very specific reason. Is it has to be experienced live. And if you want to experience it on video or on film, do a search on YouTube. There's there's way too much of it. If you experience it live, it's a genuine emotional engagement, right? You just cannot get away from that. Um, I've seen people literally go out of their minds over the simplest of magic tricks because of the way it was shared with them, right? And so I, you know, I will constantly, I'll, I'll learn. I think we'll all learn, but I'll learn how to just switch off the reaction to those feelings. Because if we don't do that, then we'll just go mad. We'll just go mad. But we we go into these things hopefully knowing that it's going to happen, that someone's going to come up to you and explain to you how you did it all wrong and that they would have done it another way. And the question is always, well, you know, so what have you what, what have you done? <laughs> and the answer is always nothing. But you can get a bit of pleasure in making them have to say that. <laughs> what I can tell you is that what I've learned is is that there's no self awareness in, in these people. You know, how many movies have you made? 
Um, how many magic tricks have you performed? Um, when was the last time you performed here at the Magic Castle? Or, you know, any of these things. And they're, they're completely not self-aware. But they're not necessarily being mean-spirited. Some of them absolutely are. Absolutely just mean-spirited stuff. And you can tell. You can absolutely tell if it's just somebody being a dick. But if you, if you imagine that most people are just expressing themselves in some way, then you have to take it like any other opinion in the world. If you walk down the street and you look up at the sky and somebody wants to tell you the sky is red, you don't have to take their opinion and you don't have to worry about it. But if you made the sky blue yesterday for some reason, if you were the person that did that, maybe you might worry about it. Well, why does he think it's red? What have I done wrong here? <laughs> so, but that's the way, that's the way the whole thing falls together is, yeah. you know, their opinions are worthless, but kind of everybody's opinion is worthless except yours at the end of the day. And it's the same, you know, as an actor, when you choose to convey a moment or a character or a line in a specific way on, you know, in stage, film is different. You know, I can tell you to do it differently. We can work together. We can do it differently. But if you do a moment, you know, it's that, it's that story about Olivier crying in the dressing room after the play. And he just gave the most fantastic performance of his life. And Gilgood comes in and says, why are you crying, Larry? He says, I don't know how I did it. And that's the thing. He, he's, he's worried he'll never get there again, the, the, which is the power of the moment, right? Mm. So, but the choices are all him. And the choices were all him when he sucked, right? And nobody else can change that. And neither should they unless, you know, he, he draws it in. So when you look out and you see the, all the smiling faces and the one unhappy face, it's very much natural for us to worry about that but it's it, it just goes with the territory there's no fixing it there's no solution just deal with it and do the next thing and um you know get on with your life yeah well yeah it's just like you know, reviews like you said i'm inst for shows except if you're uh, doing the marketing where you're pretty much supposed to be reading them and putting them forward mm -hmm. i don't uh I, <laughs> I've read the, um, Troika reviews. So the show we did in, uh, August 2016, mm -hmm. like a few months ago. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, uh, okay. I, w I was getting somewhere. Uh, how did you feel about those Troika reviews? Were they fair? I made the mistake of reading it halfway through. I think I was the one that found it and I was like, I shouldn't have read. It is literally, I was lying in bed. Maybe we were doing this. We weren't doing Troika the next day. I think it was a leftover change day. Mm -hmm. It was about week two of the fringe and I read it and I was sitting there reading it going, Hey, I shouldn't be reading this. But then I, when I read it, f the first time you read any review, I think you immediately scan for, do they mention me? Do they mention <laughs> me? Do they mention me? Is there anything about me? And in this one, it wasn't. It was about. Uh, it was about the writing. The main criticism of Troika was that it wasn't La Ronde, which was yeah. the play it was based on. It was for Coach more yeah, than, it was... other than the actors, but we, f me and Adam found it really easy to read into that and be like, oh, well, then that means that we were mm -hmm. shit because he doesn't even talk about us. Like, that's just your inner critic That's just being yeah. awful. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I have a really bad habit of listening to my inner critic and doing exactly what she wants. Prunella is her name. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, Oh, hi, Frenella. Um, and so that was a really silly. It's, I definitely need to stay away from reviews because I listen. Well, and that's mm -hmm. just not. From uh, Andy Nyman's uh, Golden Rules of Acting, there is a bit about reviews in there. He never gathered the strength to actually not read them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I, I do. I, I don't. I, I that's a great them. way of putting it. Typical yeah. Andy. But that's <laughs> a great way of putting it. Andy's a very dear friend. And, you know, Andy. Uh, came to see me at the castle one year and I was doing a show and, you know, there's my buddy in the back. And then uh, afterwards he says, well, look, I've got some notes for you. And I, I kind of felt like, well, I didn't ask what, what <laughs> notes, what, what's this notes. And then um, the next day we sat in my little apartment, which was right next door. And uh, he went through these notes and we were there for a couple of hours. And it really was interesting because as a magician, you're on your own quite a lot. You don't have a director. Most magicians don't have a director at all. They need one. They really, really, really need one, but they don't. But when somebody takes the time to help you in that way, which is an acting thing, it's an acting thing to give notes to one another. It's not necessarily a magic thing. I remember really genuinely feeling, wow, this guy's really thought about it for me 
And this is really kind. And it wasn't all good notes. This was not like, hey, you were fantastic. This is like, you need to do this. You need to do that, I think. And it took me about a year to adapt to them all. and to, But I kept them and I valued them. And I learned, you know, just from that one experience that, you know, there are there are people we need to listen to. And, you know, going back to reviews, we got a review for my, when I wanted to learn the new Final Cut, I made the decision to do the Edinburgh Fringe and do a one-man show and and get up an apartment and live there and do nothing but study Final Cut, except when I had to go and do my show at night. But I was a bit, you know, I was busy and I got up to there and I said, okay, I've got these eight or nine items. I'm going to stick them on a table in the back of the room and I'll do them in some order and I'll figure out where the show goes. And within a couple of days, the show will find its feet. And then, and that's kind of okay for some things. It's not great for the fringe anymore. When I first started doing the fringe, which was a long time ago, we're talking about in the early nineties, I was, uh, you know, I was experimenting with, I still didn't know who I was as a performer. I was trying all sorts of things and you can't do that at the fringe anymore as, as that kind of performer. You have to turn up absolutely ready to go mm. because if you don't, then all of the reviewers might come in on your first night and then you find out what the problems are from the wrong people. And that's exactly what happened to me. So when I read the reviews, they were apps, uh, not all of them, but certainly one of them in particular, I can't remember her name. Um, she was absolutely, absolutely on the nose on everything that had changed in the interim between having them in the show and me fixing all the problems and getting to the point where the show was comfortable. And then these reviews came out. And so first of all, yes, I've made the right choices. That's great. Yes, they've, you know, these are fair reviews. They were you know, three or four star reviews. They weren't five star reviews. They were three or four star. And I looked and went, this is fair. But again, all of the negativity was still preying on you as it would. But these are fair. At the end of the same exactly the same run when the show was really comfortable. I got a negative review from somebody who I knew was sitting two rows back and was having the greatest time because he had his badge on and then he gave me a bad review and he gave me a bad review. I think only for shitty reasons, which I can't imagine what they were, but I know the guy, I don't know him personally, but I know who he was and where he was sitting. And I know for a fact, he was absolutely having a great time during the show and he gave me a bad review so what does that tell you about reviewers they hmm. come with agendas it doesn't like tv maybe um whatever it, whatever it is there's an agenda and if the agenda is there if it's if it's obvious then you know it's not a review it's hmm. not a review and i think reviewers are very 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 rare you know people can write well they can have informed opinions but the ability to actually i mean just film critics how many film critics actually can tell you everything you want to know about a film without revealing a single thing about what happens in the film. That's rare, you know? So spoilers are everywhere when you know, a big film comes out. The massive spoilers, what's not a review? Yeah, that's true. We had that very <laughs> weird revelation ourselves, actually, because we started off as branding ourselves like we we're going to be a movie review podcast. And I think it was like three or four in, we kind of sat down and thought, it's like, it, it, kind, it limits you. Mm -hmm. I feel it totally limited us to be like, we have to stay on the movie. We can't just let it be what it wants to be. And now it's just, it's more a discussion podcast because that's where the fun is. And that's where you get to enjoy what you've seen because you, that inspires you to go wherever you want to go. Yeah. So I feel reviews are, they're, they're so, sh uh, tunnel vision is the best word I think mm -hmm. for reviews. Reviews are so tunnel visioned on one aspect that it's, a, it's, it's a very disciplined format if you do it well, but. I think it's become hugely undisciplined. I think Ain't It Cool News is one of the reasons that that happened. Ain't It Cool News was a site that I really liked for a while. And now I don't believe a word they say. They're, they're too much in the fanboy um, zone. And I also think that Harry is taking money from the studios. I think this is an issue with a lot of people that have been writing there and moving moving away, is that he, he is raving about films that are absolutely terrible. Now, maybe he's just got terrible taste, but he didn't at the beginning. You know, he was a guy who came in and would say, you know, this is wrong because of this. Now he jumps in there and maybe he's just taken the, maybe he's not, it's just just a feeling. But I do th feel that this has been an issue between him and some of his writers. So I looked at Ain't It Cool News once a year now for the last couple of years, solely for the gift guide. You aware of this? The holiday uh -huh. gift guide. So there's a guy called Quint used to write for them, um, named after the, the shark hunter in Jaws, Eric Vespi. And he's moved. He's no longer there. So I went looking 
on the Ain't It Cool News. And I saw a couple of, you know, in quotes reviews and I had a quick look. It was the usual kind of terrible. Um, they're just so delighted that their favorite costumed character is now in some picture. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't find a gift guide and I did a little search on Eric Vespi and I found it. And he's moved to, uh, I think it's called Rooster Teeth. And mm. um, if you're a Rooster Teeth, I don't know what the rest of the site's about. I, I don't endorse any of that. but And I, I might, I just haven't looked. But in there is um, his gift guide. And it's crazy how much work he's put into all the geeky stuff you can have for Christmas. Um, so that was the only reason I went back to Ain't It Cool. And I now have zero reason to go back because I don't trust their reviews. You know, Harry used to talk about what he what he did when he got up in the morning, and you know how he what mood he was in when he saw the movie, and there was an en enjoyability to it. Whereas now, I just you know I just don't see any of that. You know, I miss uh, I miss Drew, who's now at another site, and um, it was called Moriarty, and but that that felt like a discussion site and a discussion stroke review, whereas now it just feels like a cheerleading site to me, at least. Hmm. So. Um, and also at the beginning, you know, Ain't It Cool was getting reviews from people who saw the movie six months before it came out, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they, I mean, they destroyed Bat, uh, Batman and Robin, and rightfully so, I think. It was it was a sucktacular movie. <laughs> <laughs> the Batman Visa card. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, um, it, the, the closest I can think about that, that whole movie was like the guy that dresses as Batman outside the Chinese <laughs> theatre in L.A., ah who I once crossed the road with and we both stood there waiting for the little light to come on. And I just thought, this really isn't how it's supposed to happen, is it? And the Batman <laughs> just waits, you know, citizens wait until the light comes on. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, we can talk about Batman for hours, let's not talk about Batman. But it, yeah, there's definitely, you know, reviewers are not necessarily reviewers. And if we listened to all of the reviews, good ones or bad ones, we would never do the work that we're supposed to do on the next, we, we have to ignore them, especially the good ones, I think. Yes, mm -hmm. we've got this uh, mm -hmm. Mamet quote that uh, we've been given at mm -hmm. the ACS, which uh, I don't remember which is the, the devastating one. Do you remember the... About the reviews? Yeah. Good ones are never good enough. No. Um, oh, I know what you're talking about. The good ones are never good enough. And, and the, the bad, bad ones are just... Sort of devastating. Devastating, yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, there there is a, there is an angle to that. I think if you can, you can shut your eyes and you know basically pretend that you're a genius, and ignore the bad reviews that way, or you can just accept that you're never going to get a hundred percent of the people, and you know you're you would go insane if you did, right? So yeah, I I think I think it's nice to to hear about a good review, um, and it's sort of negative to read a good review. And um, I think exactly the same is true of a bad review. Yeah, you got a bad review. Okay, you know, move on. But you know, when you when you see something that is, especially you know, I mean, Batman versus Superman. Everybody's really down on that movie. I went to see it with um, with Connor, and halfway through, I said, "This is not this is not bad at all." Actually, I was enjoying it. There's a point where I really kind of felt it went jumped the shark a little bit with the laptop full of trailers. <laughs> for future movies but the you know i generally enjoyed the movie and you know it was great because i think you know when wonder woman sort of turned up you know this nobody really knew anything about that character and you know they picked an amazing actress and you know that's by the way still the best of all the movies is wonder woman by far but even that film could have stopped about an hour earlier than it did mm. after you know the whole scene with the that, that scene with the village was great we could have stopped the movie somewhere around about then and we would have been happy. The rest of it was a little bit much. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, all the reviews for that was super positive, um, most of which was deserved. And all the reviews about um, Suburbicon, which has just come out, have been, you know, very negative, really. I mean, there are positive reviews, but they've been very negative. And yet the people I trust have said, no, this is a good movie. If you decide to go into it with a certain agenda and decide to compare it to the Cohen movies, because obviously they wrote it, then you, you can be negative about it. But I think a lot of that negativity came from other agendas based on other things that are going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. We struggled with the Suburbicon episode. We mm -hmm. had a 12 Angry Men moment because uh, oh. they thought it was bad and I brought them into the good uh, side. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what, what mood do you sit and watch a movie? I remember trying to sit and watch um, a film. What was it? 
I know one example, but it's ridiculous, which is the Jack Reacher movie. I tried to watch a Jack Reacher movie and it was just terrible. And I thought, this is, I can't watch this, it's awful. And then I was just in the mood to watch a really sort of dumb thriller. And I enjoyed the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I really enjoyed the hell out of it. And it was, you know, your mood is so important when yeah, you watch totally. a film. I think this is one of the reasons why Netflix is almost impossible is because what it needs is a button that you press and it reads your thumbprint and tells you what mood you're in and then only brings up movies for that mood. <laughs> because there's things that you think, oh, I should watch that, but I can't be bothered. Next. And you, you end up skipping the ones that you... How many times watching Netflix do we watch the first 10 minutes mm. and then just realize I'm not really in the, the mood for this? Yeah, that's not necessarily yeah, a bad movie. So that's one of the things I hate about Netflix. Um, but, you know... It's also one of the things I hate about, you know, the general film thing now is like, can you grab them within that window of, you know, you know, VOD, um, which sounds like a disease because it is, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> can you grab them, you know, and that, that was actually, you know, going back to our magic, which I think we were talking about a couple of days ago, <laughs> um, the, the, the thing about our magic was how do you, how do you try to grab the, it's a very talky documentary, you know, it's not, there's not, you know, there's no fly in the wall stuff really. But how do you grab them? And it was that that question at the beginning, what is magic? None of the people we asked had any idea that question was coming. And, you know, I was very, very, you know, overly, you know, anal about not revealing anything about the interview because the very first question was that, because I wanted that beginning of all the reactions to that question. <laughs> um, and, you know, there was one guy who's not in the movie right now um, who we did interview and, you know, that didn't face him at all. It just came straight out with an answer. But he was the first person who I said, nope, that's not going to do it. That's the answer you give non-magicians. I want the answer you're going to give me. And that really threw him. So there was like a double double hit on that guy. But yeah, so, you know, I think um, it's, it's hard. The first, you know, does this film grab me in the first 30 seconds? Well, should it? A film is, is a 90-minute experience. And I think we we owe it to film to give it, a full 90 minutes, good or bad, and to tune out only in the extreme circumstances, it, you know, it, it sends us out. Um, but we don't do that. We've become a little bit um, uh, complacent. It's like when you ask someone, have you seen this film? And they're like, yeah, oh, I was also doing this and this and this and this, yeah. but I've seen it. It's mm -hmm. like, but we can't have a conversation about this now. I <laughs> I used to do uh, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. do uh, watch a movie, uh, but obviously I don't do that anymore because last year we learned about how a movie works and uh, now it, it, to be able to, to see what I like or dislike and why, I obviously have to give my 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think we have to get out of the assessment mode very quickly. We assess, you know, if we're still assessing the movie 10 minutes in because we're in that mode, we're not really watching it. Yeah. Um, mm. the, I think, you know... Putting your phone off in at home is maybe something that should be, you know, encouraged, but it's such a compulsive device, these things. Um, it's hard at home, but, you know, I do try to just, you know, take it out of the room to, to some extent. Um, but, you know, that's hard. And of course, as we know, some people can't do it in a movie theater. And that's, it's becoming a thing now that I, I just, I, I think it's, it's really, really simple. You know, they do have cameras in every movie theater monitoring the room. And if anybody lights up a phone, then, you know, they should pause the movie, come in and kick him out. Yeah. <laughs> you know? When I saw the girl Snapchatting during it, I, I lost my mind. I oh, honestly lost yeah. my mind. I couldn't believe it. That in we'd in got Thor, to this I stage. saw somebody doing a, a FaceTime. What? They're what? FaceTiming somebody. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. What? And what they were on? shocked when I came down and asked them to put the phone down. <laughs> of course they were. Oh because they, they were not just doing that. They're also holding it up, you know, so that they, it was ridiculous. Sorry, I can't, I need to get the light of this. Oh my. It's this horrible God. thing because like, I think they're shocked because they're just so in their Britishness. Like, oh, no one's going to tell me to, to stop it. So my mom would happily do it because she's German and that's what they do. I beg to differ. I, I was in New York. I was in oh. New York where, you know, they want an argument. Everyone's looking for an argument. <laughs> but the funny thing is, is that, you know, the three or four people who were between me and her, um, it was, it was, it was Thor Ragnarok and it was, and I went, they were, they were all like giving me the thumbs up as I went back. <laughs> Why couldn't one of you just say, excuse me, could you stop doing that? Because, you know, partly because in America, there's a chance they might shoot you, which <laughs> has happened, you know? Yeah. Oh God. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's bad, you know? And of course, and, and, and it's a, it's, it's a girl. 
you know, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a, you know, whether she was in her teens or her early 20s, I don't know. So, you know, you've got to be careful, you know, giving someone a fright in the movie theater. <laughs> but I'd rather, I'd rather they just policed it. Somebody came in and said, hi, um, could you step outside, please? I'd like to have a word with you. You can't come back in. It's true. That's we'll have it. a tray yeah. at you know, the, the I mean, We're really sorry that uh, you had a lot to do during our movie, but um, <laughs> come back another day. These other busy. people paid for tickets as well. Yeah. yeah. And you're not getting a refund. That's it. You know, um, people, you know, yeah. I'd love to see people standing outside eating the popcorn that they paid for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you know, it's like the popcorn of shame. You know, those people can't look, get off their phones. Um, but yeah, FaceTime is a bit hardcore. Yeah. I had yesterday, I went to see Blade of the Immortal, mm -hmm. the new Takeshi Meek, uh, yeah. film. Great film for kids. <laughs> yeah. 18, uh, rating. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, it happened. It was not as hardcore as the FaceTime, but someone put his phone, well, someone called and he answered, but just as you said in one of the episodes, he just said, uh, well, no, I can talk right now. I'm, I'm watching a mm. movie. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but just just don't answer. Probably, no, I don't. You know. Your phone should be off anyway. Like they should. I've had be... people answer phones in live shows. <laughs> I mean, in a live show with about forty people in the room in the Magic Castle, and somebody answers their phones. Most people in that environment will deal with them for you. You know, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's an entitlement thing. I think some people don't think about it, and some people just think that they're entitled to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, yeah, me and Nook when we saw. Um, the Shawshank Redemption in Glasgow, hmm. we had one person's phone go off during the final monologue from Red, and then during the same monologue, another phone went off. Yeah. Poor just, guy. Oh. It was such an, and it was, he was the, the only guy on stage, and it's a big stage. I mean, you're at the, yeah. uh, oh, what's it called? Oh, I can't remember. It's the one beside the conservatoire. Yeah. Um, it's a big stage and flood uh, spotlit and all this kind of stuff. And two phones during a monologue. Like even if you're as you even if you're a professional or an amateur or whatever, like that's yeah. that's tough for you to probably carry on and the the worst the worst part of all of this is the lack of shame. Yeah. Mm. That they don't oh I mean if my phone went off in that situation, I would be deeply embarrassed. And rightfully so. Um but you know, it's really simple. I think the there is a cinema mode now. Um, I think for Apple Watches, you know, you can set a cinema mode or a theater mode, but it's ridiculous that that's necessary. Uh, yeah. You know, it's very simple. Just put it on airplane mode and don't look at it, you know, yeah. don't look at it at all. And again, it's, it, it's just down to the fact of like, this is a great movie. We hope you enjoy it and uh, put your phone on and you're leaving. That's all it is. We will ask you to leave and that will change everything. It'll also probably kill the cinema industry, to be honest. You know, yeah. there, there was a, there was a chain, by the way, in America that was proposing that you could absolutely use your phone, and the there was a big backlash against that. But I was in a movie theater recently where the the adverts that come up before the you know before the actual movie adverts, you know, the kind that are going on on screen with questions. Have you ever seen those here in 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 the states? When you sit down for the you know the time before they start rolling the actual commercials. There are things going on on the screen. Mm. Some of it's video, some of it's depends on the, the theater. But this was asking you to use your phone and engage with what was on the screen. It's telling people to have the phone in their hand. Now, I know that happens anyway, but I think from the moment you get in there, it should be that thing's going in your pocket and it's not coming out from that moment, you know? And I think it should be from the very moment that the trailers start, maybe. Commercials, fine, but the trailers, because the trailers are interesting to some people, mm. but yeah. the trailers are on, that gives you as a theater owner, um, you know, or your staff, obviously, it gives you time to assess if there's a problem in there, you know? So you can go in and say, listen, if you don't put that wager in the movie, we will ask you to leave. It's the last warning. Okay. That's it. Done. Um, you know, and we do own the technology where we can come up and give people seat numbers. You know, yeah. at, the, at the beginning of the movie, you know, please do not, we're talking to you, 14K, you know. We also have the technology. Electric shock. <laughs> yeah, we all, yeah, we also have the technology to give them, you know, a, a, a near fatal electric shock. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you can order food uh, and have it delivered at your seat in certain theatres. Yes, and that's, that's obnoxious as hell. So I used to I used to work in that in that chain. I used to work in that chain. And, uh, at the Cineworld chain? No, for the, for the theatre that brings you the food. Uh, at the interval, and it is totally bizarre. Mm. It is totally bizarre. Yeah, you know what? You can go a couple hours without eating. Oh, it's, yeah. it's definitely doable. And um, I, th I think all food should be banned, but I know that's not practical because that's how the theatres make their money. But, yeah. you know, uh, food 
before and after. I think cinema, good restaurants and good cinema combinations would be great. Um, but until somebody figures that, that puzzle out, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, what's going to happen is we all have better and better televisions and better and better home projectors. And, you know, we can set up a better environment in my house um, than I can get by going to the big movie theater that's just a, a five minute drive away. That's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, you guys just always get onto this, don't you? Yeah, oh, I know. We all just, I want to change this morning. This, the, we, mo the movement to change what's going on. Somebody's got to say it. <laughs> yeah, we we do like Cine World because the of the limited card. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm always uh, most of the anti live that appear. I'm going to see at the Grosvenor. Mm -hmm. uh, when there is space left, there's mm -hmm. the tiny, like, old-style cinema with sofas. I, I don't support the Grosvenor anymore simply because, you know, they let go of all their staff. And, you know, I was friends with some of those people. But I don't know who's there now. I will go back. But for the period, you know, they, they basically let everybody go over a very, you know, what seemed like a minor thing from the press. But there was a lot of passion in that building for, for, for film. Mm -hmm. People willing to work extra hours for film. And I don't know if they can recapture that by just getting rid of everybody and bringing, you know. So I haven't supported the Grosvenor since. And that's a great little cinema. Um, you know, I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying I personally don't make the effort to go as much as I used to. Because I used to like going in and seeing, you know, so many people that work there, so many people that ran the place. I used to go into the projection booth in the back because, you know, I knew those guys. Um it would be a real shame to me if that particular cinema ended up just becoming a little cineplex, mm -hmm. you know, which it has to do that kind of business because that's where the money is. But it also used to, you know, get prints of Halloween and show them at 31st of November of, mm -hmm. uh, of October. Wow. So, you know, that's where you premiered Gunman, right? Yeah. They, again, you know, they, they did a, they did a great deal with us. They really, you know, helped us make that happen. You know, it wasn't free, not at all, but they, they realized how they could help make that happen. And it was a really good thing for us. And, you know, also for them in that, you know, we drove a lot of business to them as well. Okay, great. I think mm. we can go into the Marcel Proust, uh, Bernard Pivot, James Lipton questionnaire now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, Paul, what is your favorite word? What is my favorite word? I, I don't know, we, you, 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 you gave me some of these questions beforehand and I knew this would happen because, <laughs> you know, if I went away for a day, I'd, I, it would be worse. Um, I think a word that comes to mind is is um, a word I I remembered, and it's just one of those things that for some reason it's a very positive word, and it's jacaranda, which is a tree, and uh, it lines all of the streets in Los Angeles. And I think Los Angeles is at once a beautiful place and once an ugly place. There's a lot of ugliness to be found there in terms of, you know, the competition and the backbiting and all that stuff. But the funny thing about Los Angeles is it also has the most wonderful people and the most wonderful positive vibes, and genuine positive vibes. I don't mean the, you're marvelous. I don't mean that. <laughs> I, I think it's, so the jacaranda is a tree. It's a beautiful purple tree. And I remember the first time I went there that they caught my eye and I, I find them really wonderful. And uh, the cherry blossoms, which are in Tokyo, which I went to see this year, are stunning and amazing and wonderful. And they celebrate them because they're so beautiful and because there's such a powerful shift in tone in the whole city. Um, but it amazes me that the, the, the jacaranda's there and just sort of taken for granted a little bit. Um, and when you tell people from Los Angeles, these are just stunning. They go, oh, yeah. You know, whereas you say that in uh, in Japan, you know, these cherry blossoms are stunning. Of course they are, aren't they? You know, and they know every, it's so the, so jacaranda is a word I actually memorized because and, you know, I was getting it wrong. and I still do for some to some extent, but I just couldn't remember what the name of the trees was. And it became one of those things that just reminded me about uh, um, beauty and positivity. So an odd word, but it's what comes to mind. <laughs> OK, thank okay. you. Uh, what is your least favorite word? My least favorite word, um, I think it would probably be a word that's also in a way my, one of my favorite words. But I think when it's used as an excuse, the word impossible is definitely one of my least favorite words. I hate to hear something's impossible when it turns out that it was 
absolutely achievable in one way or another. And it's one of the things that draws you to magic, right? You, you know, this can't happen. That's impossible. Well, I can make it seem to happen is is one of the objects of, of magic. It's genuinely impossible for me to make you float in this room. But if you and I work on it together and, you know, um, we think about it, we can make it seem like you can do that. But that's not the term. I, I think when you get to a problem and it's dismissed as impossible, then that that word is um is one of my least favorite and you know there are other words i mean you know there are horrible words in the world um right now but i think impossible is one that always makes me sit up and go nope no no i'm not having that and that's so yeah yeah it's a, it's a least favorite but it's also least favorite that inspires hopefully something positive I think there's an object that uh, boils down to that from a, a guy I really like, the uh, Anything is Possible bottle, Jamie D. Grant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Harry Yang, who, who did those bottles originally, I mean, he, he wasn't the very first, but he did an amazing series of these bottles. And, you know, my friend Jason, Jason England, who co-produced uh, Our Magic, he has one, a Demijohn, one of those giant wine bottles, you know, the type that, um, you know, big glass bottle with a big cork in it. And in there, there's a pair of shoes. There's, you know, th th uh, there's all these things that absolutely can't be in there. And the the reason that Eng did this is, is to inspire people that anything was possible. And so what Jamie did is Jamie branded it in a way that I thought was beautiful in that, you know, this isn't just a collectible, it's a reminder. And so as, you know, Harry Eng's now gone, but Jamie has his own way of taking a, a brand new sealed deck of cards and putting it in a bottle that absolutely is, there's no way you can get it in through that opening. It's a sealed glass bottle. And the bottle is a, is a milk bottle with a cork in it. So, you know, he hasn't made the bottle around the deck of cards. He's had to get them in there. And if you smash the bottle and you open it, you will find a perfect deck of cards in there. Um, and, uh, you know, some friends of mine had a show where they brought that, that into the show and when you walked down and uh, I can say this now because the show is, has been retired but the entire back wall of the theatre was nothing but these bottles with decks of cards and did you go see that show? No but I've seen the picture the Derek Del Godio and uh, and uh, Helda Gamerish yeah okay and Derek and Helda had this wall and at some point you would pick a bottle out and smash it and there would be something inside that I won't reveal but it was just you know and, and then when you're leaving and you realise these are all like that you know and that's not a trick. That's that's a shift in perception. Mm. So, you know. And there's also an interesting aspect. He made it like the Send Wonder campaign. So he's putting some of those everywhere in the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. I love the idea, you know, that something exists somewhere. And, I, I you know, I, I, that's in my work. It's in a lot of magicians' work. The idea of creating an impossible object. Um, you know, Michael Weber is a genius at this type of thing. Creating something that you can own and look at it and go, well, that just, that can't exist. You know, and the simplest one is a playing card with a hole punched in it and or, or, a, or a business card with a rubber band in there. And you can look at it forever. You will never figure out how that rubber band got into that playing card. And, you know, or, or taking two cards and linking them and letting you have them. You know, it's all these things are wonderful. But um, that's just, you know, another we could talk about that forever as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what turns you on creatively, spiritually or emotionally? Um, creatively, I mean, kind of anything to some extent, uh, you know, I get story is everything, you know, I mean, if I, if I get an idea for something, it can become, you know, almost like a virus taking you over until you, until you have a fever with it. Right. Um, which makes me want to do a Christopher Walken impersonation, but <laughs> the, you, you can, you know, this notion that you can do something is really interesting. And, but where those notions come from comes from kind of sitting up and taking notice of things, you know? So I, I, I now schedule into my life very selfish, personal time to notice stuff that you can't notice when you're interacting on your day-to-day -day life with the people that you love, right? And, you know, you just, but, you know, even today, you know, today, you know, I, I went out and, and you know, um, we went for a walk in Pollock Park today and just took the time to notice this thing that we'd driven through, I mean, you know, and not noticed. But it was interesting that I've learned, I've had to learn how to do that because life does move quite quickly, right? And you've got a lot of shit to do. And, you you know, this thing about stopping and smelling the roses, that's not a joke. 
you had better do it. And if you don't, then you you fail to accept input, you know? Mm. And you may get things that, you know, come subconsciously. So, you know, I was in New York recently and I, I wanted a couple of days just to think about a problem in terms of, you know, a creative problem and to, to turn it over in my mind. And I walked miles and miles and miles because you can do that in New York. And I was turning that over in my mind all the time. And then I went to the Met and went through the museum and started finding ideas that applied to that and then found all these ideas that applied to something else. And then that, that, that didn't exist before I walked in and paid my, you know, $25 to get in. So I go looking for it to some extent, but I, I kind of let it find me. But creativity does come from a lot of places. And I, I think the art world is a great place to find creativity because, you know, it is all stolen, right? We're all stealing ideas um, and changing them because that's all you can do. You can't create something absolutely fantastic from raw nothingness. It has to have something. This is why I really worry about the music industry. You know, when people say, oh, you know, we've got a computer that will analyze this song and it's brought up this note pattern that's the same in something else. So we're going to sue you now. But that's how music was always created, right? So we have to be very careful. But, you know, that's that's lawyers and money talking, which is, a, you know, yeah. another thing. So... Yeah, I, I creative, you know, creatively, I, I kind of get it from wherever I, I take the time to notice something, um, and you know, try not to steal brazenly, but steal creatively. Um, I can't remember what the other ones were. That was the creative. It was an or, but if you want, it was spiritually and emotionally. Um, and yeah, spiritually, emotionally, I, I get that from you know, you know, literature and, and art and and film and people, and you know, taking the time to, you know listen to things you know um there are certain people that i i i choose i've chosen to be inspired by and uh i think so far i've chosen quite well right right um you know you can you know you can find out that you've made a, a dreadful choice um as anybody you know who's maybe studied under harvey weinstein might you know mm -hmm. but uh, although you, you can't be around that kind of odiousness without noticing i think um, not closely anyway, but I, I've, I've got some really inspirational people in my life. Um, you know, Juan Tamaris is a really good example, you know, and I know a lot about Juan as a real person and the day to day, -to -day things of, you know, but it's the, it's when you get inside that mind and, you know, he shares things with you, it's really good. And it's a real privilege. Um, but then there are people that I've never met that I've chosen to, to learn a great deal from who, who may be long dead. You know, uh, so I, I think that I think most of it comes from actually making choices, and you know, I you know I could read something by some someone who I absolutely don't want to be like or respect or you know somebody awful. I could read something and and learn something from it, but you know I don't care if the greatest line of poetry is in Mein Kampf. I still, you know, I cannot in any way. You know, the worst thing I would do is to find something like that in that, mm -hmm. you know, thing, because then, you know, it's tainted, right? So you, you have to make your choices very carefully. But at the same time, you know, you sort of have to have some kind of balance in all of that. Long, long answer. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Unusually. What turns you off? Um, lack of enthusiasm is a big turn off. I think that, you know, we can have all the worst problems in the world in terms of creatively, um, but a, a lack of enthusiasm or, uh, you know, we all make our choices and what we get paid for things. Mm -hmm. Um, but if that's all you care about, then that will turn me off. Um, so, you know, I, I do find that, you know, people who see everything with a price, that is a, that is an issue for me that, you know, we all have to do that. There is an element that we all have to do that. But once you commit, commit you know, a hundred percent. That's why I, I genuinely think we should all be doing things for free as creative people. We have to, and I, I don't, but it's not free. I mean, without money, I mean, you know, and the more successful you are, the more you should try to find ways to do that. But even at the point where, you know, very young in our crafts, we should be trying to not just to get experience, but to interact with people and share the experience together um, but, you know, not at the expense of making a living, not at the expense of, you know, being, and certainly not being taken advantage of. But I think when people only see things in terms of money, um, that can be a problem. Sometimes it's completely fine, 
you know, you can't ask someone to do something for free when they need to pay the bills, when they absolutely need, you know, they need a, you know, <laughs> it, they, they, they'd love to come and help you, but they need to do their other job to make the money. That's a different thing. It's a very big discussion that, but I'm talking about people who, you know, everything they see is basically measured in terms of um, monetary value um, or other types of value, which are equally problematic, but that will, that will definitely turn me off. I like the the enthusiasm of just getting in there and doing it, even when there's conflict, even when there's problems, even when there's unexpected disasters and all that stuff. Everybody having enthusiasm will help, you know. But it's also, you know, my job to keep that going. Well. <laughs> yeah, well, we're having friends in there, and it's, there's no money involved. It's just fr friends coming because mm -hmm. they're friends, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what is your favorite curse word? Um. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think the one that we use most is obviously fuck, because it's it's very diverse. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think, I don't know. You know, if I really thought about it, it would have to be a French curse word, <laughs> because it is the most beautiful word until you say it to a French person, and it's enculé. <laughs> See. See, it's a beautiful word, isn't it? And yeah. I, I absolutely told people, you know, when you go see a magic show in France and you really like it, you should you should clap and shout enculé. <laughs> and you know, what they've does done it mean? that. Um what does it mean, Jan? Um technically <laughs> it's um uh, well, you would say like the act to to do someone in the ass. Ah. ah. So that's the yeah. sodomize mm -hmm. kind of the exact translation. Yeah. It's Motherfucker is is a, is a, you know a lot of people try and explain it that way but what they really mean is it's it's a foul word but it does sound quite lovely to yeah. our ears. And so that to me kind of tells you how ridiculous you know words are in terms of you know their power. You know there are words that I think are just hideous. I mean absolutely hideous. Um, and I, I don't like to hear them used by anybody. Um, but it's just words at the end of the day. Intention and words don't necessarily go together. Mm. Mm. But, you know, they are an indicator of something. I do remember going back to, um, you know, being younger and, uh, you know, there was a contraction for the, the term Pakistani, which I won't repeat now. But I was very, I'm not confused, but... There was something about when, when we were taking that out of the lexicon, when we were saying, you can't say that anymore. I was confused because it was never intended in my vicinity to be a bad word. It was always contended as a, as a contraction. And a friend of mine, um, you know, who, who was Pakistani, he explained to me that when somebody threw a brick through his grandmother's window, that was one of the words that they used. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I realized that, you know, it really isn't about my opinion. Mm. Right, <laughs> and that was the most important lesson I had about that, and I never, I never used the word again. So the the way that we approach words is 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 interesting to me in that what we find offensive has to take into account um, the people who it impacts the most, rather than the actual intention. Because you can be brought up by people who are, you know, racially. I don't want to use the word indifferent. Indifference is a good word, but insensitive is a better word. Mm. And but it's not deliberate, and you know it's not conscious. But the effect is still the same. So there are some words that I will not allow to be used in anything that I work on or to have around me. And I think that's a good thing. But they are just words. So there's another part of me that says maybe we should just get used to saying this all the time, mm. and that way it just takes, you know. But the N word is is a thing that you know it bothers me that. We have we have created a you know maybe rightfully so but we've created a situation where some people use it and some people can't use it right and then that just makes it very difficult because mm. it's there and it's there all the time and therefore it leaks into people's brains and so it becomes part of their expression mm. and then you have to stop yourself whereas it's just some words that you know for a fact you don't use that word unless you're an awful person right so I think words so onculate. It's a beautiful word. In another language, it's an ugly word. But I, I like the fact that as a, as, a, as a series of sounds, it's actually quite nice. And I can convince people to shout it out during French magic shows. <laughs> oh, yeah. So. That's actually really interesting because I once had a problem with one of my friends who's also, I'm half Pakistani, mm -hmm. and he is also half Pakistani. And he was like, 
he hadn't seen me for a long time and he was like, hey, my packy. And I was just like, what? You mm. can't do that. Like, just because we, and I know loads of people are like. That's great. He's want- put two wrongs together into one set. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just like, what do you mean? That's so weird. But like, I know loads of people that would use it because they want to like re mm-hmm. kind of like take it back or whatever, or yeah. like, like have control over it. And I know loads of black people have it with their mm-hmm. words or, or whatever. Um, but that does make a massive issue because like that word has context and history. So if you don't understand that, then don't you, I would say don't use it at all. Yeah, I would say don't use it at all, but that's not because I understand the reasoning behind taking a word back and owning the power of that word, right? Yeah. I get that. But you have to take into account my inability to understand that, right? From my, you know, I haven't had to deal with these issues and I need to understand that. And it's a confusion. Mm -hmm. So it just gets in the way of my ability to understand that part of the journey. It does, you know, you know, it's easy to take offense to anything we're saying here and to paint it in a bad way. But it's just a simple fact that for us to all to relate together, sometimes we have to take words out of the lexicon. Um, and no matter what the intent was originally, if it is taken over by uh, Nazis, right? If they take it over, if they take a completely innocent word and use it, then, you know, a friend of mine who's a very, you know, is an older person, um, you know, over 80, he says that he's always kind of, you know, not disliked, it's not the word. It's always kind of been sad about the fact the word gay has has changed meaning because he loved the word gay for what it meant before, to have a gay evening, to have a gay time. I mean, that's all great. And he's right to some extent, but, you know, it's actually a, a very good word to use in the modern, you know, it get, you know, it doesn't seem to have any, not yet anyway, it doesn't have any, you know, negative repercussions unless you're an awful person, mm-hmm. right? And yeah, I don't care who you are. If you think there's something wrong with that, then there's something that there's something awful about your personality mm. that you need to deal with and they don't need to deal with, in my opinion. Yeah. So words are interesting to me in that they have these interesting powers. I quite like using the C word um, in my tech, but I, I would never direct it at a woman. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and it's it's just one of those things that that feels really bad. So as friends of mine who don't like the word say, well, in that case, you, you know, you're still putting it on the table and that can connect with people who would use it in that way. So it's a uh, it's tough. But yeah, <laughs> as, as a writer, it's a very interesting thing. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it's a very interesting thing. And, you know, I, how can I write a, you know, a black character and use that word? I, can I use it correctly? Mm. I just don't know if I can, you know, and um, I, I just don't want to stand on that, on, on that particular issue. Mm. And it's one of the things, you know, with, you know, the stuff that I have written, you know, I, I see, you know, with Isolani, there's a character who represented a certain type of character that I felt I could write. But when it came to writing her as a woman, that, you know, that was an issue. And, and so that, that's, you know, that's a problem if, and so, you know, there's one of the reasons why, you know, while she's definitely abused physically and she's definitely, you know, um, manipulated and, you know, I think treated horribly, I didn't want to get into the, the aspect of, of sexual abuse with that particular character. And, and definitely there's a scene where that could have happened. Mm. Mm. And it was mm. mostly because I felt there was enough pain there anyway and I just didn't think that I could represent it in the way that um, it deserved. So words words are interesting to me. And the ones that I do use and the ones that I don't use is a very long, uh, as we can tell from this answer, <laughs> a very long conversation. But, you know, it, it's interesting to talk about. But I think we do need to talk about it. But we also need to talk about it in a safe space where, you know, um, we can go back and forward for a while and then not have any repercussions mm-hmm. yeah. afterwards. In, in the very early episodes, uh, I said that the C word is actually uh, something different in Scotland, in Scottish. Yeah, yeah, which is? Uh, isn't that uh, um, a boy or...? It's kind of used playfully yeah. by a lot of Scottish people. Uh, yes. It's a friendly It's a friendly thing. You say it to friends. You call friends that. Yeah. Um, but in Scotland, if you turned around and said that to, um, you know, 
a woman or a girl in a bar or in a public space, you will get five or six people who stand up. Yeah. It's one of the things about Scotland that's great. <laughs> that's the, interesting. I've never yeah. seen it as something that you, like the, the gender specifics of it. I've never, I never knew that that was something that people felt. Like mm. I always just thought of it as a word. I didn't know that there was like, people felt don't say it to a woman. Yeah. That's interesting. But that kind of makes sense because obviously with what it means yeah. and because it's violent, mm -hmm. And yeah. it has like connotations that make sense. Like that's it says something very horrible about the user, which yeah. is why it's used in a lot of you know. Um, I mean, uh, you know, Tony Soprano uses it in The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. to talk about a woman, and I think it's, I mean, it's a real turn on that character too. So you know, I think um, yeah, words are interesting, but that's you know, that's our business. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that is our business. Okay, uh, so yeah, what sound or noise do you like? God, are there more questions? Oh my God. <laughs> Um, what sound or noise though, like I, I, I do, um, I do genuinely love the sound of the ocean, um, which is a very boring answer. And um, you also like long walks on the beach. <laughs> no, no, not long ones. A short walk is okay. <laughs> but, the, but the sound of the ocean, you know, because I've, I've done a lot of traveling on ships, and um, I, I do really enjoy that. I didn't know until I first went on a ship for an extended period. But um, yeah, I love that sound and. Um, but if there's one particular thing, I I think it's it, it's an odd thing because it always you know what do you think? It always comes from our childhood, right? And there was there was definitely a sound as the as a movie started or as the projector got going when you're in a movie theater, mm -hmm. and um, it was usually followed by the Pearl and Dean theme. Um, when I first as a kid, a very young kid, when I went, I remember that theme. And then, of course, later on, they made fun of it and it became a bit of a... a, a and they brought it back, actually. But, yeah, there was definitely a sort of crackle that went there. And that crackle is, is you know, the curtain was opening. All of that. That was a lovely noise. That's the... the, the we have this noise in our introduction. We do. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've, just, I've got it on the loop. <laughs> uh, what sound or noise do you dislike? Um, any, any cell phone going off in a movie theater, I think we can... Mm. We've covered that one, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll just merge the two next ones. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt and not attempt? Oh, oh, um, profession. Well, I don't know. I really don't. Um, I, I don't see anything else. Okay, great. That's a great statement. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Can't imagine myself doing anything but what I'm trying to do right now. Mm. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Sucker. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I, I think uh, that's an interesting question for someone who's, you know, I'm technically an atheist. That doesn't mean I, I, I don't have any thoughts in terms of spirituality and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if I turned up and there was, you know, there was pearly gates and there was a God or any of that stuff, um, I just think... I'm kind of with Jerry Andrus, who's an old magician who's, who's long gone now, but Jerry was a, you know, didn't believe in God and would have long, long chats with, with very religious people and very, you know, honest and giving and very respectful chats, which is, I think is a good thing. And he said that, you know, if he died and he found himself in heaven, you know, his first question to God would be, why would you allow all of these terrible things to happen? And, you know, so I, I think that the first thing I'd like to hear is something that explains all of that. Um, but, and I'm with him on that, I think. And Stephen Fry's got some thoughts on that too. Um, mm. but you know, I, I think ultimately, uh, I, I hate the idea of judgment. I hate the idea of if you didn't do this exactly right, you're going downstairs, all of that. I, I think if there was anything like that, I just think, um, Whatever the sound is, it should sound like love and acceptance and, and being part of whatever else is happening next. I think that should happen for ev everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that even means the really dreadful people of the world because, mm. you know, um, it's an odd way to look at things. But, you know, judgment, is it just doesn't seem like something that an omniscient being would take part in. Mm. We all started with the mother. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Let's okay. not talk about that film. <laughs> Uh, no, I, <laughs> no. Uh, if you were, so to follow through, if you were reincarnated as some other plant or animal, what would it be? I think it would have to definitely be a dolphin or a whale. I mean, definitely. But a whale would be better. Um, 
part only because you know it just it's a it's a state of being um that i think would be really interesting you know um without the you know ships full of uh japanese whalers mm. um you know mm. murdering me <laughs> but uh, without that um i think it's just something about that would be you know that because apart from anything else you get to see a whole other part of the planet you know mm. and, uh, nothing can really touch you you know um but yeah that would be interesting great it's plugging time france scotland england scotland Go go podcast rangers, <laughs> mighty plugin podcast rangers. Go go podcast rangers, mighty plugin podcast rangers. So, Paul, <laughs> I hear from Mark Westbrook that To the mm-hmm. Sea is entering the festival circuit. What is To the Sea? Uh, to the Sea is a film that Mark wrote, um, lovely little script um, the, that we shot on the coast of Scotland earlier this year. Um, we shot it in lovely grainy black and white vision and, uh, um, you know, standard uh, Academy ratio. And uh, it's a little period piece from the 70s that I, I, I really like, actually. It's, it's quite a disturbing, you know, uncomfortable film. And I don't mean because it's violent. It's just, you know, um, things take a, a, a bit of a turn. I think the only thing I can tell you about it without ruining too much is that uh, um, two uncles take their nephew to the beach um, with a dark purpose. Oh. Mm. Already sold already. Yeah, yeah. sounds great. <laughs> Amen. Uh, the film, the location was close to the Kulzian Castle, right? A Kulian Castle. A Kulian, yeah. yeah, sorry. Kulzian, if you, if you look at it phonetically, but Kulian Castle. Beautiful place. Definitely you should go. Mm. Haunted. Um, yeah, I mean, it was haunted by me for a week because mm. I lived there um, <laughs> for the, the week. But yeah, it's definitely got a... It's got a personality unlike anywhere else. Stunning, stunning place. Okay, great. So, um, do you have anything you're, so just remember we're in February. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what are you working on right now? A specific show magically or a specific, uh, movie project? Um, per- personally, I'm, I'm working on a TV project that's been going for over a year now and just gradually inching forward. So, I have no idea where that will be at the point that you hear this, but um, that's that's always very high in my mind. Um, another short that's been around for a couple of years that we finally started to get some interest in. Hopefully, um, we'll get the chance to do that. It's quite extremely ambitious short, which could maybe one day be a feature. And um, you know, uh, another feature film which is being written as we talk right now, and will hopefully be um, in the final draft. By the time you hear this, but that's uh, quite exciting, and I'm really into that at the moment. That's um, uh, very high, and uh, you know, magically, always, you know, traveling and performing, and having, you know, having the 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 opportunity, the blessing of being able to just see the world with some very odd people. Hmm. Um, But at the same time, you know, a pack of cards, which you know I picked up when I was eight years old, is still carrying me um, around the world. Yeah, great. Right. You you talked about a TV project. Yeah, you. I think you're probably well known throughout the world for the real hustle. Mm-hmm. I think this should be uh, there should be screenings in schools because in terms of public service, this show is just yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we should teach all the children to be scam artists. I think you're right. <laughs> uh, no, to yeah. avoid. Yeah, no, I I think um you know I think it definitely it's a great. I noticed that there's millions and millions of hits on little individual scams. The ones that apply to people who travel, especially. Um, and that's good. That's good. But, uh, you know, there's a market to maybe do another series like that. And I'd like to maybe do something like that. I think uh, Real Hustle went as far as it needed to go. Um, but even if it was the same three people, you know, we could do other things in different ways. And, you know, it, either we were going to do that or we were going to do something else. So far, we've done something else. The problem always was that, you know, they got very lucky and that they got three people who could really do it without being criminals. Um, And that's always been the issue whenever they've tried to revive it somewhere else. Mm. Doing it is really a lot tougher than you think. Um, Mm. It's not an acting job. It's not a magic job. It's a very, very different set of tools, which, you know, Alex and Jess and and I seem to actually have. Um, But we've, you know, we've never found anybody else who could literally think on their feet. And because you you just need a way of thinking. And I think conveying that way of thinking to people was a great purpose of the show as well as entertainment because people would quite often say you know I, I i was someone tried to scam me but i 
it didn't work because I'd seen it on the real hustle. Mm. And that's always great. So Yeah, there I think there's never been an official D V D release, so, but still you've got loads on the official uh, website yeah. or YouTube channel. There are some unofficial DVDs. Somebody actually made a whole set of DVDs and was selling them. Um and they looked very professional. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I took great pleasure in the fact that that was a pirate set of DVDs <laughs> of the hustle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bootleg. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, um, where can our listeners get to know you better? Your website, social media? Um, you know, there's, you know, I'm, I'm R. Paul Wilson on Twitter and, uh, you can follow me as R. Paul Wilson on Facebook. Um, you know, we, I have, I have, site conartist.tv which tells you a little bit about me but most uh my other site is purely for magicians and just just for them to um to share ideas and stuff but uh yeah twitter is probably you know as good as anywhere and instagram it, it pretty much everywhere i'm r paul wilson okay great well we'll definitely try to get you back for isolani when it's get when it gets closer to have a distributed here's distributed. hoping yeah yeah yes uh well Thank you. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to our listeners. It keeps growing. It's yeah. Nice, it's going well. It's going yeah, well. Great. Yeah, thanks good luck with everything. Thank you. Yeah, and hopefully we've, um, we've helped cure some insomnia today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, we were... Adam. Anouk. Jan. And... I think I'm Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.